presentation. Uh, Thomas Tietz, <coughs> the title uh, is a trade-off between a song complexity and uh, colorfulness in paired birds. So, Thomas? Yeah, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, I'm inviting you to a trip where uh, ecology and evolution are more on the uh, macroevolutionary um, scale. Um, sorry. Oh, it works. Yeah. If we look at birds, then we'll find that pattern that there are some 40 different orders, but there are only three in which there are species that can learn the vocalizations. And uh, in total, they make up over 50% or half of all bird species. So this is uh, always being considered as a pacemaker of evolution and diversification uh, within uh, birds. And it's also important to point out that these uh, green lineages, the so-called vocal learner, are not closely related to each other. So this is either something that's invented three times or since it also occurs in, in mammals, of course, um, that's something sometimes found in vertebrates or not. So something maybe uh, old that can be switched on uh, or not. So this is a very, uh, big picture in, in bird vocalization evolution. And, and we have to uh, discriminate here between uh, calls and songs, of course, because these calls can have very different purposes to use and they are mostly very short and simple as we uh, just heard in the, in the previous talk as well. So also, of course, more easily detectable and identified uh, automatically. What we are interested here are the um, complex vocalizations that is at least um, in northern hemispheres are used mostly by males uh, to defend the territories and to attract females. So these songs, although this uh, example is quite simple, um, are, are more complex, as I said, and uh, are the ones that are to a certain degree uh, learned and so this is called cultural uh, evolution in comparison to inherited traits that are innate and uh, genetically determined completely. Uh, why study parrots uh, in this uh, respect? Um, it's a very widespread um, family of passerine birds, although not found all across the um, uh, continents. Um, there are quite small, more or less of similar size, as we will see. Um, also shape is mostly uh, the same and almost all the species are found in similar type of uh, woody habitats. Uh, we studied their uh, history in some detail, have a multi-gene phylogeny, still working on the, the genomic work here. Um, some species are, of course, rarer and, and only found in few places in the tropics. But nevertheless, this is a species complete phylogeny, also dated to 15 million years ago. I know for the non-vertebrate community, this is very young. But this has also to do, of course, with this uh, cultural evolution I, I mentioned before. The origin we, we figured out with various approaches are the East Asian mountains, so the Sino-Himalayas, so the, the southeastern part of the Himalayas and the other mountains in the southwest China. Um, the genera we observe today, they uh, were only created some five to eight million years ago. And in this time, it was also that uh, uh, on, in one of the major clades in North America and in the other clade Africa uh, were colonized uh, three times each uh, indi um, independently. So if we look at um, the morphology of, of parrot birds, um, we'll on the one hand find apart from two really outliers, they are more or less of a similar handy size um, although most uh, bird banders and ringers don't like these spiders in their hand. Um, but then uh, we find many different uh, colors, coloration patterns. And so this variation is uh, the one um, 
differentiation I want to consider here apart from acoustics. And I want to relate the two things because in vocalizations, especially the, let's say, complexity of the song, uh, we have a lot of variation. And the main question of this talk is whether this is more or less, um, let's say, super cool birds that have uh, colorful plumage and sing very variedly, or is there a kind of trade-off because both features need kind of an investment um, that needs energy, of course. But let's approach the song evolution uh, with two more general um, aspects, let's say confounding variables for our main question. So on the one hand, uh, there is a general um, negative correlation driven by physics, of course, uh, between body size and song frequency. And although um, they are more or less of uniform size, we might find this. Then, of course, I showed you they uh, occur from tropical forest uh, into the Arctic and in many different habitats and, of course, climate regimes. So um, uh, the distribution, meaning the different climate regimes they live under, um, might also confound uh, certain other correlations. But nevertheless, the final question will be, um, does uh, more colorfulness coincide with less song diversity across these uh, tens of species? So is there a kind of trade-off on this um, uh, level uh, under sexual selection, most likely? So the, the good thing in bird vocalizations is that uh, for almost all species, at least many, many uh, at this time, it was over 10,000 of uh, 10 to 11,000 species. It's a matter of taste and science, you know. Um, they can be shared in Xenocanto. This is uh, hosted by one natural history museum, um, Naturalis. Um, but there are, of course, also other archives um, for bird uh, vocalizations specifically. The cool thing here is that it can be more or less automatically uh, retrieved and uh, you don't have to ask curators uh, recording by recording if you can use them. Yeah, and then um, this was one uh, approach new to me at that time and also that I um, now learn it's common uh, in this community here to use most uh, advanced uh, technology to speed up and uh, facilitate analysis, or analysis of um, vocalizations. Um, but in the bird community I come from, this is not yet standard uh, um, stuff. So what we used mostly here is that um, machine learning helped us identify verses in these many uh, recordings we used. And uh, we also, for the first time, used um, this R package for um, uh, analysis. When I started, I had to use the huge <laughs> sonograph of my supervisor. And the first step was to, to do this on computer, of course. Yeah, uh, one more uh, scientific um, prerequisite was that song frequency and complexity are not per se explained by sexual dimorphism in this clade and, and most uh, passerines. So this uh, does not disturb um, further analysis. And the good thing for me was that we, uh, together with two students, could analyze over a thousand song recordings in just two weeks, the minute we had uh, set up all the stuff coming from uh, Pierce's uh, evolution paper. Um, and this is more than three times the amount of uh, recordings uh, than I uh, analyzed during all of my PhD thesis. So this is how um, this field is developing um, in these times. So of course we need uh, many more data to, to uh, uh, incorporate here. So the size can be taken from the general handbooks of birds and climate niches. This was of course a lot of more preliminary work. Uh, we also used GBIF for the different sources for bird occurrences around the world. And for all these localities, of course, we could take the bioclim variables and then um, model the uh, average niche, climate niche uh, for the different species. 
some arbitrariness we have to keep in here for the colorfulness because if we really want to measure this very objectively that would be much much more uh, effort just, just from the same handbooks we we looked at the very good drawings there and um, defined the standard plumage regions um, of the birds 11 and found across all parrot species uh, nine different colors and four of them in light and dark uh, version. And that's used for the um, colorfulness in, in two different ways. So this looks maybe um, not very successful, but for all the different traits we look at and all the many different taxonomic changes the birds uh, went <laughs> under in the last decades, uh, it's actually quite successful to have 55 species completely covered out of all the 64 species accepted in this uh, context here. So the, the song features, of course, we aggregated um, per male, so per recording, and per species to have one uh, number per species. And we had to take uh, phylogeny into account to uh, correct uh, in such a comparative uh, approach here. And yeah, although there is not much difference in uh, body size, we could show what uh, everyone would expect, that the bigger the bird, the deeper the voice. This is always quite uh, uh, nice, so you can be sure um, your data set might not be corrupted. Then it's more tricky to interpret uh, the climatic trends. So the principle, the first principle components is mostly loaded by the minimum temperature. And this is uh, correlated with song complexity. And this is something that makes some sense to me because um, temperature means energy and uh, the more energy available, um, the more energy is available for uh, more complex songs. Looking at the second principal component, which is mostly loaded uh, by precipitation, uh, it's less clear to me why the mean frequency um, is um, yeah, so clearly correlated here. Uh, I see two possibilities. So either there is some physiological burden, if this is a habitat with a lot of rain, um, or it's something that's often been found in the context of urban ecology with this uh, low frequency noise that has to be um, overcome with uh, high vocalizations. Maybe that's the same for the droplets uh, that make this low frequency noise. Then for the maximum elevation where birds can be found, there is also uh, higher pitch and uh, this is something I have no clear idea so far and would be happy for any uh, ideas um, you can share with me via email. But finally, we found what we were looking for and uh, this was uh, exactly this colorfulness uh, inversely correlated uh, with song complexity. I'm not going into detail now how we measured song complexity. Actually, we did it the same way as in this um, evolution paper in actually different ways, but all of them uh, show this pattern more or less the same way. And um, it's actually too clear a pattern <laughs> for an ecological correlation, but we're very happy to uh, find it. Um, and it makes uh, a lot of sense, although um, uh, single species experts doubt it somehow, but um, yeah, this is always uh, the issue with um, microevolutionary approaches that people point out a single point and say that's not true for this point, but uh, it's not about a single point, of course, uh, but about these uh, 55 points and how they behaved. Um, um, across 15 million years of uh, uh, evolution. So to summarize uh, this whole study, despite quite uniform size among parrots, the general negative correlation of body size and song frequency could be recovered. 
and if sound complexity and frequency are influenced by distribution and thus by interspecific differences in climatic niche and we could find that minimum temperature increases complexity which makes sense and precipitation increases uh, the mean frequency for which we found these two uh, possible explanation and, and less clear is why parrots in higher ele elevation also sing at higher pitch and finally what we um, postulated uh, more colorfulness coincides with less diversity in songs uh, across species which we interpret uh, as a trade-off on this uh, level um, what i'm telling you here uh it was not just coming from myself, of course. Uh, over many years, I uh, interacted with a couple of uh, tit and chickadee experts in, uh, across the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, I got support from my former colleagues uh, in Basel. And of course, such studies are not possible without all the enthusiasts who share mostly freely their recordings and also photos uh, uh, on the web. And all these um, um, packages and scripts we used were also mostly provided by many others. So thank you to all these people and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, for your interesting uh, talk. And uh, we can open discussion. There is uh, one comment by Tim Mallet Mullet that uh, say, High elevation may include the more low frequency wind creating masking effect for lower frequency songs. What do you think about this comment? Do you see? Yeah, I see. And uh, this makes a lot of sense. Um, you see in the background uh, Himalayan <laughs> uh, where I studied. And um, here um, we, we found that of course the community um, thins out towards uh, the tips and uh, the summits. And so um, this is something that, that always is in the back of my mind. And, and I'm very grateful uh, to a more closer, more um, physical explanation. This is very helpful. Thank you, Jim. Okay, um, if there are no uh, rice and so we have a little delay uh, i 